For over 30 years, Situation Management Systems has trained the Positive Power and Influence program to people all over the world in an effort to empower themselves with the knowledge and tools they need to deal with difficult situations at work, at home, and everywhere in between. Our CEO and host, Sherry Maloof, has been training people about positive power and influence all around the world for most of her professional career, and recently got her PhD in human development within the School of Leadership at Fielding University. Her co-host, Rana Selvale, has been with the company for more than 10 years now, and is not only a client services consultant, but a trainer of the program who has directed various learning initiatives for some of our most important clients. It's the Sherry and Rhonda Show, <laughs> the podcast. Welcome to Conflict. How do we want to talk about conflict? Um, I think it's appropriate at this time to talk about conflict and the holidays. <laughs> It seems up for a lot seems, of people. It, 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 I think it really does. It, re- it really does. I know it does for me. So you're in a situation with a family member that um, does the same stuff that they've done every Christmas for the past 20 years. Yep. And, and I address it, and it never changes. And I know it's never going to change, so... Really, I should just not address it, but I feel compelled. <laughs> you feel compelled to try to make change? I try, to, try to, to improve the relationship is really what it's about, and it just seems the holidays is not the right time to do it. Um, but I feel with the buffer of family, maybe it's there's a safety net there. <laughs> and I'm so wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think... Um, so, you know, we teach people how to deal with conflict. Um, and w- and one of the big parts about conflict is how do you manage the emotions that go along with it? I mean, it sounds like you start to feel really frustrated. Yeah. And I'll either raise my voice and say something inappropriate, you know, filter off, um, or I'll just exit the room. There's no tact involved whatsoever. Yeah. And I know better. I I, I know what the result is when this happens, but it, I get overwhelmed. Yeah. I don't think I avoid much. I will, uh, I will get mad. Yeah. I don't think I avoid though. Well, maybe sometimes I do. Maybe I'll sit back and just not say anything, but that's rare <laughs> with yeah. me. Um, but you know, when we, we talk to people about conflict, it's usually because there's a particular individual or person that they feel is very difficult to deal with. The person is either aggressive, uh, adversarial, um, or just plain old difficult. Yeah. You know, I mean, those are all different things to deal yeah. with. And I think women have a bit of a challenge with conflict anyway, especially in the workplace. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a, how you're perceived when you manage conflict or when you're, um, you know, going after something that you want or need that you know is going to raise conflict within the organization or within your particular group. And you have to approach it, you know, delicately. All it takes is some man (laughs) saying uh, what you've said and everybody accepts it or... uh, Having a tone of voice that's very sort of put downish, mm-hmm. and a lot of women just well, your energy gets deflated. Yeah, and you're prepared. You're 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 prepared for it because you know it's going to happen, but it still has the same effect. I mean, we did a program for a bank who will be unnamed at this point <laughs> that uh, really. We called it leading through adversity, and and the the goal of it was help women deal with difficult situations and difficult people because women react in a particular way around conflict too. Yeah, we do. I mean, yeah. we tend to want to keep the relationship, um, so we might not directly address the conflict. Yeah, we all just get along. Right. <laughs> Let's sing kumbaya together. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's it's kind of interesting what we do, but 
Um, one of the things that's very important is when you have a conflict that you need to resolve, you know, what we teach people is that there's three very important things, right? One thing is plan. Yeah. Think it through. Uh, the other thing is uh, manage the whole meeting as separate phases. We talk about different phases in managing conflict. And then the final thing is, is the influencing skills. Um, they're critical for implementing all of those phases. So let's talk about planning for a minute. Do you plan for conflict? Um, in, in, in the work environment, yes, when I'm anticipating it's going to arise. Um, or if I know it already exists. Mm. Uh, in personal, I journal just so I can get some of that anger out and that, those emotions out on paper because then I can deal with them. But it's still, it's it's so different because that one button gets pushed and all my work is just gone asunder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we. It's, it's hard thinking about those buttons, but... I, I mean, the other thing that's important is to be very grounded, you know, when you're doing it. But the planning piece, I'll just go back to the planning. The planning piece is important for a number of reasons. One is to really try to understand what's going on with the other person. Like, what's driving them? You know, if somebody's being even adversarial, why? You know, what do they hope to gain from it? What what can you understand more about that person? The more you understand about that person and their motives, uh, the better you are at handling whatever comes your way. So the planning, I mean, we talk about it from a bunch of different angles, but it's what's driving people, but also yeah. what are people saying they want? What do they yeah. need? You know, what's important to them? And what are some creative ways to resolve it? Like, can you move it from being a out-and-out -out fight to a problem-solving situation that you're both trying to figure out how to solve the problem together? Yeah. You know, that's the ideal, yeah. is that you shift people so that they're working together. So the planning helps you think that through. Well, get, getting, you know, putting the information down to, to come to an agreement that there is a problem so you can work together on the problem. You know? people, some people don't think there's a problem, and that's a problem. Yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> that's your first problem. Yeah. You have to influence people. There's a problem. Yes. Yeah. And and again, it and I do know this is so much is is the way you approach it because you can't. You're never again. You can't control what's on the other side of the table ever. You can only control how you react to it, and that's. I think that is one of the the lar largest benefits of of planning and practicing, is you. Feel those emotions and you think about the potential objections and you get, you know, hopefully you can get past them with each level of practice. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, it's a powerful thing to do to plan and practice. Um, a lot of it just helps people try different angles, try different ways, think through different approaches. I don't know, it's... It, it's a tough one, you know, when you've really got somebody who seems to be out for your blood and you don't know why, it's to figure out how to have a conversation with that person and turn them into an ally. And, you know, what, what's interesting is, you know, with planning and practice, um, you know, how we, we like to record. It's wonderful that we all have phones that record because I discovered in one of my attempts with this family member, um, I get this facial expression. <laughs> and I mean, it, it, it almost makes me, the face is like I'm dismissing the whole thing. And I, I wasn't even aware that I'm doing it. And I'm willing to bet you that I know what my buttons are, but I'm willing to bet you that's, that's one of hers. Mm. And being aware of that, but it's a subconscious thing, is it, it's, it's powerful, but I, it's something that I know I need to work on because I know she shuts down the minute that I have that do, look. Do what I do. <laughs> <laughs> Uh-oh, Ryan's it's, got the look. It's sort of the pointing the finger without doing it. I'm doing it with my eyes. <laughs> uh. Self-learning <laughs> and awareness. Well, it was interesting because I was working with somebody yesterday, and I realized that when she gets a particular tone of voice on, 
uh, because she's trying to get details and information and stuff, that that tone of voice or how she approaches it, for some reason, I get irritated. (laughs) And it was interesting because then I sound, and and this is somebody that's doing something for me that's awesome, that's helping me, um, but there's a tone of voice that she gets that kind of, I go, "Uh uh-oh, here we go. Yeah. (laughs) This is going to be suffering. Yes, yes. I'm I'm familiar. And so um, I'd never really thought it through before that I reacted to that because then I sound like I'm impatient when I'm answering questions that are fine, you know? I mean, it's like, there's another one. You know, so it's interesting because you can have little teeny tiny conflicts yep. and then you can have huge ones that require yep. a lot of pre-planning. But just noticing what you react to and what pushes your buttons yep. is a step in the direction. And that's where, again, that's where I found that the, the, the videoing of myself was very powerful because I really didn't realize how much of it showed on my face. Because mm. I know I was thinking it. I know it was in my head. And well, you're, see not, it. you're not a really you know? very good poker player, really. No. Are you? Nope. <laughs> so we would... Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it's making you flush right, right now. Isn't it? See, right? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so planning is, is definitely, you know, a really good way to prep. And... One of the things we have people prep is what we call the phases of conflict resolution. And there's uh, six different phases, and we have them labeled. They're all uh, labeled with P's, because for some reason I like P's. So it's planning, obviously, is the first part. But then platform, what's your basis for moving forward? Perspectives, what are people thinking? Problem solving, hello, Packed, what's your agreement? And then performance, what's going to happen? Um, so they're kind of snappy little right. <laughs> set of, <laughs> of phases. But if you don't do, for example, your planning well, the rest of it's not going to go well. If you don't give yourself a good platform, in other words, create a positive climate for people to actually deal with whatever the conflict is in the next set, which is the perspectives. Yeah. You know, people have different perspectives on what's going on. So if you haven't really um, done a good job at, you know, creating that platform, the rest of it's going to be tough. It really is. That that initial opening sets the tone. And it's not that you can't recover from that, but in a lot of cases, you're probably doing what you were talking about with the disengaging and saying, you know what? I don't think we've gotten this off to the right start. Let's let's pick up again in an hour or something like that, or tomorrow or next week, whatever. Um, so it's really important to start things off on the right foot. And so if it's somebody that is an adversary and you're trying to create a positive climate with that right. person and their adversarial right off the bat... Right. And you can't manage your own reactions to that person. You're in deep doo doo. Yeah, that's a technical term. Yeah, it is. We like to use it (laughs) in in the circles of conflict and coaching. Deep doo doo. Yeah, Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Uh, You know, we do so much electronically nowadays, and what I wish other people understood as well as I think I understand it, is when you're dealing with an email or even a text message, the emotion's on the reader. Mm. Because I have, I've responded to individuals positively and received very negative feedback, which allowed me to, to realize that, okay, they're, they're upset about something. And my instant response is pick up the phone. Yeah. Because if there's tension... It is not going to be resolved electronically. You need to talk to somebody. Yeah. And I always tell people, if you have to do phone, do it. But there's so much video technology today. Skype them, Zoom them, WebEx them, 
whatever. Even, oh my goodness, miracles do happen. Meet them face to face. What a concept. Yeah. Right. An, envi- an environment change is, can, can change the nature of a conversation as well. Yeah. I find that people will say the darndest things on the phone that they wouldn't say if they were face to face with you. They won't even do it if they're on video phone, yeah. you know, whatever, video conferencing. But man, if just put that phone in and wow, yeah. some people go to town. I guess they feel safe. Yeah, we, well, because they can't be seen. I think I think that's the the, the texting and email as well. It's it, there's a perceived anonymity, but we know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so the face to face or somehow getting face to face in the process is really really important. It's also if you're trying to build a relationship with somebody, if you're trying to repair it. Um, If it's just overall, it's just a very difficult situation because maybe the relationships are fine, but the situation, there's stuff going on sometimes between different functions and organizations. They have different agendas, different, you know, uh, challenges. And it's hard to sort that stuff out if you can't at least get face to face. Yeah. And that's, again, that's why I think the environment change can, can make a big difference as well. Sometimes just getting, sitting in a cafe as opposed to being in the office and change the quality of the conversation. Yeah, I agree. It really it, it can change the dynamics hugely. Um, so the other thing that, that comes uh, in when I talk to people about conflict, there's three different pieces that I have people think about. Trust. Uh, quality of the relationship yeah. and then power. Yeah. Yes. And and once trust is broken, it's very, very difficult to get back on either on either side. Well, but, it takes both people talking it out and really being authentic and open and I mean it's not impossible. I'm I'm recently uh, working with with an individual, um, and she wants to work with a vendor who's a replacement vendor. And there are some details in the contract that the replacement doesn't seem to want to adhere to. And it's at a point right now where she's wondering, how much energy do I want to put into this relationship? Hmm. Because it's her trust has been, it's it quickly disintegrating. And it's really interesting because she's, we were working on this as a, as a situation. And it was a matter of backing up that I really have to consider whether I either even want to move forward with this. Because that trust is, is, is fractured. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard. Um, trust is is something that that can take time to build and but can be destroyed very quickly. So, especially if you're looking at conflict in a situation, part of the planning is is if trust is an issue, that's what you have to build in your platform phase. That's what you have to think about. How do I how do I build trust? And generally speaking, um, if you've blown it. Like if I've blown something, saying sorry is a great way to do it. It's interesting how those two little words can be so hard to come by. <laughs> Where owning owning the mistake, yeah, just it 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 ends it, it can end a conflict. Absolutely, sorry, my fault. And it's very it's it's often very hard to get to get those those two little words. They're right up there with as important as please and thank you. Just saying. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Good old fashioned stuff, right? right? Exactly. Common courtesies. Yeah. And they've become that less and less not common. Common. Mm-hmm. People don't do it as much as they used to. But I'm trying to think. So the other thing that helps build trust is information. And so, you know, it can be scary to reveal information, to disclose information to somebody that's being adversarial because, well, 
they might just use it against you. They could also be withholding information that you need to make a better decision to manipulate you to get, you know, to, to be on their side, particularly if there's that adversarial relationship as well. But I mean, if we, if I genuinely figure out, and this is, again, this comes back to the planning, yeah. what I can safely disclose, like not everything, but what can I disclose to this person so they understand my intentions? Because I mean, I'm, I can sit there and be a victim and say this person's being adversarial, but what are they thinking about me? Why are they being adversarial? What's their perception of me? So if I can, you know, take responsibility for half the relationship, yes. If it's an adversarial relationship, you've played a role in that. Um, And if I can take responsibility for that part of it and go, okay, what could I disclose to this person and feel safe disclosing that would enable them to come a little bit in my direction? You know, maybe it can back them off from being adversarial to just aggressive. Yeah. <laughs> and then I can move them from aggressive to difficult. Right. <laughs> and then I can move them from difficult <laughs> to cooperative yeah. and then finally collaborative. But um it really takes understanding what's going on in that person's head. And that's what you're looking for too, right? That that back and forth. Because it might not happen in that moment, but at least if you're opening the door a little ways, each time you're connecting. It's really funny because, you know, we teach negotiation, which is a little bit different from mm-hmm. conflict. Um, negotiation, it can be formal and informal, but for me, conflict is usually about issues versus price. Yeah. You know, it's usually about something uh, less concrete. And negotiations can be about stuff that's not concrete. But um, I tend to think of conflict as being a little bit um, different. And that it also involves all. There can be, you know, negotiation can be a part of the process of resolving a conflict, as can problem solving and all the rest of the um, stuff that we think about when it comes to dealing with conflict. Uh, but one of the things that I always tell people is is that you have to create a positive climate. And everybody goes, oh, I can't stand small talk. <laughs> and it's like, oh, my God, really? We're not talking about small no. talk. We're talking about what's important, what matters to you and the person across the yeah. table from you so that you can connect. And they're, they're, you know, it's it's interesting because so many of those little pieces for the connection, you know, you can't see. They're, they're intangible. You have to find them through connecting. Well, it's where common you know? ground comes in. Mm-hmm. Yes. You know, yeah. what? why are we I mean, sitting at the right. table together? Because if, if there wasn't something that we had in common, we wouldn't even bother talking to each other. Exactly. So what is it that we have in common? What's the common ground? What pulls us together? What pulls us to this table? That um, is used, I think the data is something like five times more frequently by effective negotiators. And obviously it's huge in conflict resolution. So it's what is it that we share? What do we have in common? What can we um, agree on? If you start yeah. a conflict conversation talking about what you agree on, again, it helps have that positive start. So it's not yeah. small talk at all. But, we, you know, we always want to get right down to business. Right. Let's get straight to yeah. business. What's the problem right. here? How do we solve it? And so then we get into these arguments because somebody will say, well, you're not doing your job. You're not doing the role that you were expected to do. You're not you, 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 you. Right. And the minute that comes out, yeah. the other person's like, oh, no, yeah. you, 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 you. Mm-hmm. So now we're in the you, you fights. Yeah. And both are, on the, both are on the defensive and nothing gets resolved. No. You'll just walk away yeah. frustrated and uh, not yeah. have gotten anywhere. So it's what do we have in common? What do we share? And it, it creates such a different feeling in the room when people can talk about what they share, what they have in common. It brings them closer together. And you want to come closer together. 
because the next step is is that you have to talk about what does this conflict look like? What are our perspectives? And so you want that common ground to be strong enough so that when you talk about those perspectives that you can handle it. You don't feel like running out of the room. So it's how can you create glue in the beginning? And, and common ground is certainly, certainly a great way of doing it. Um, and thinking all that through is, is an important part of it. So that's, that's an important part at the beginning. Yeah, it, it's, in, it's interesting going into a room with, with, you know, with, with a positive motivation instead of a negative one. And it's, it, it can be a challenge when you've had such negative interactions with that individual. But once again, only you can control that. That's right. Only you can control that. The onus is on you for this. I'm afraid so. You know? <laughs> we like to be victims. Yeah, right. But <laughs> we really aren't. Uh, the other, uh, so then, then we're into really looking at the different perspectives. And this is where we feel how different our thoughts, opinions, needs, whatever it is. That's that gap. And this is where people start to get upset. Yeah, I, it, 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 it's very interesting how, you know, individuals will always go about things the same way. And if that perspective becomes a driver of all of those conflicts, there needs to be some, some clarity or a, a way of determining how to work together with our different perspectives. How do they, how do they work? How can we use these in conjunction as opposed to as opposing forces? Well, and the other thing is, is to figure out how far apart you actually are. When people are mad at each other or frustrated with each other, they don't tend to listen. And when they don't listen, all they hear is the gap. They don't hear the common ground. So starting with the common ground is helpful. And then really trying to figure out what the other person is saying. So, And this is really hard for a lot of people. Uh, actually actively list, listening to the person's perspective. So playing it back to them. So it sounds like you think that my group has been uh, doing a poor job, that the quality of our work uh, has been causing you extra work. You know, for a, a team leader to sit down and say that to another team leader yeah. is hard. Yeah. When they feel like what, what they want to scream out and say is, you all aren't doing your job, you know? So the ability to feed that back and say, so it sounds like our group is causing you extra work. That's what you believe. Um, and so if I can understand that and stop and say, okay, why would that be something that person believes? Why would they think that we're causing them extra work? Because... Uh, Maybe the issue is is that we've been given different criteria, and we have no idea what each other has been given. You know. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's interesting how very often um, in those team situations, the teams break off into individual silos, and they don't really know. They could be working on completely different directives, but because they don't, even though they work laterally. They have different information coming down, yeah, and I see that happen, you know, particularly in matrix organizations. Now they're all, you know, unless they get together, and that's not—that's often not how they work. Yep, I've done my part. It's now yep. up to you. That's it. Yeah, I mean, it—it's it, interesting that something so. I mean, we can sit back and say, "Oh, this is obvious." You've got different directives, but you know, there there can also be the possibility that there is a group or a team that just is doing low quality work. Yeah. I mean, that's not unheard of. Not at all. And so how do you deal with that? Know. You know, I mean, it's, it's tough to say that to somebody else, you know, your work is, it's not what it needs to be. And um, that's, and that's, I mean, that's the, 
I think that's a big part of the planning as well, because you look at who you really need to have this discussion with. Sometimes when it's a when it's a major performance issue, it's not your charge at all. But some people feel it is their charge. Good. <laughs> and that ruffles that can ruffle a lot of feathers. You know, there was a, I had a very in- interesting situation with um, with uh, another virtual uh, classroom participant with uh, the asserting style. And the verbiage was written so much like a, in his mind, like a review. And he said, I don't have that. So I, I'm not responsible to give them a review on their behavior. Mm. So I need to find another way. It's like, no, you don't need to find another way. You need to find appropriate words. And that's a, that's a big part of the planning process as well. Yeah, just thinking you know? through. Mm-hmm. Mm. So we're in the phases and if we uh, do a good job on our platform and do a good job on perspectives, we should have a pretty accurate picture of what the conflict is about. Yep. And if we've done all of this well, we can just move into problem solving. But, you know, for me, what people have to do is create a all-inclusive problem statement. So, for example, if, if the other person, if there's a problem with the quality of the work... Yep. You know, a problem statement can't blame anybody. Right. It's just the problem. So the problem could be something like um, team B is unable to progress uh, to the next stage. Mm-hmm. So it's very, it, it doesn't say because team A right, is right. doing <laughs> terrible work. It's just what's the problem statement? Right. The problem statement is we can't take the next step with this project. So it's really, really hard for people to do a neutral problem statement. And it's one of the most powerful things that two people can do who are in conflict together. And it's the thing that I coach people on and coach people on and coach people on. And I talk to them about, I said, neutral problem statement. Here's 500 examples of neutral problem statements. And they come in and they still point fingers because they're so lost in the emotion of the conflict that they cannot do a neutral problem yeah. statement. It's not my problem, it's your problem. That's right. When it, actually, it's our problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it's such a tough thing to do because people get emotionally attached to they are right and the other person's yeah. wrong. The world of right and wrong. Yeah. Well, that's where, you know, to go, back, to go back to listening, how many people, when they should be having a conversation where they just need to listen the moment they hear something that they don't agree with they stop listening because they start thinking about what their answer what their rebuttal is going to be <laughs> if you're thinking you're not listening it's true <laughs> you know? it's true a lot of, yeah and listening is a critical skill in any of this the conflict the negotiation listening i mean we talked about the three pieces the the planning yeah um the phases and then the skills, listening, common ground. These are all pull energy. People have to use pull energy in a situation where they just want to push and judge. The neutral mindset is huge in being able to move into, you know, because again, if I can create a real uh, problem statement, a real neutral problem statement, then we can probably solve that problem together. We can figure it out. You know, maybe you've lost, maybe the, your team isn't doing great work because your chief engineer has a critical illness and you haven't been able to replace that person and everybody's scrambling trying to do the work for this chief engineer. Yeah. You know, there could yeah. be all kinds of things going on that explain it that you're not privy to because you're not a part of that team. Yeah. So again... <clears throat> you know what's the problem? Oh, yeah, we need to get you an engineer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How do we do yeah. that? You know, again, sometimes there's simple simple solutions based on understanding really what's going on in the situation. Um, other times, it's, it really isn't that simple. It can be a lot more complex, and it takes more time to figure it out. But we can't figure it out if we're approaching it from a judgmental, uh, right, wrong universe type yeah. of uh, mindset. Yeah. And, and I think it, 
we also want things to be solved five minutes ago. So we have to be willing to take the time to work through the conflict, commit to it. Well, the interesting thing about time in this is that it really is uh, important for people to um, manage their emotions. And sometimes that takes time. Sometimes you have to listen to somebody complain at you for a half hour before yep. you can calm them down. Yep. But they'll calm down if they feel listened to. You know, I mean, that, that will definitely... Oops happen well i know one approach i'm taking this holiday season um before the joyful breakfast is i'm going to do the grounding exercise i'm going to grab one of your facebook videos and ground with you um, because i think if i can get myself into that neutral place right before i go in the door instead of the place that i'm going to be as we're driving um then maybe maybe we'll get a couple of steps closer to where to where we need to be you know, it's interesting, the one that I did this week, um, I talked about what grounding does for you and the energy that comes from your head versus the energy that comes from your heart versus the energy that comes from your gut versus the energy that comes from your pelvis all feels different. The head can be logical, rational. You know, the heart is caring. The gut is need. And the pelvis is just really strong driving energy. So grounding balances all of that. So you're, you can be uh, better in your impact on other people. It's not coming from a particular place. Like some people are very rational. You know, everything's got a logical solution. Uh, and it doesn't, you know, hit people right, especially in conflict. You know, don't give me all yeah. the reasons why I shouldn't be upset with you right now. That doesn't tend to go over well with people who are very heart-driven and very much into their feelings and their emotions. There are people that are very much driven by that. Yes. So the grounding is an important piece of being able to, again, get through the perspectives and move into problem-solving. Because if we can get through all of that, then we can create an agreement yep. and we can implement. You know, I mean, it, it, the last couple of phases go quickly if we've done a good job exactly. on the first one. Exactly. You know, there's so much in laying that foundation with the platform and, and really um, understanding the perspectives. And, you know, this all doesn't have to be done in one conversation. It can be spread over time. Maybe you have to go back a couple of times to actually be able to have the conversation. Maybe that's what you have to do. Yeah. Yes. It's it that that's that really is the the bottom line that you know I'm not going to I know I'm not going to walk out of the house with you know a result, but if I can get some movement I would feel you know significantly better. And that would make it a that would certainly improve my holiday season. <laughs> Well, I mean, the interesting thing is that what happens over time is that you can build trust, you can build the relationship, um, the differences in power can be, you know, figured out. All of that stuff can be managed over time. Sometimes we don't have time. We have to go through all those phases in one meeting, and it can be done. You can go through all the f phases in five minutes, or it can take you five months. Yeah, you know, either way. But you know, going back, the the critical things are thinking it through, understanding that there's a step by step process that can manage the the conflict itself, and your interpersonal skills. Yeah. I think all three of those things really make it a uh, much more. Um, Easy, much more easy, much more easier, much easier. <laughs> My grammar isn't yep. great today. <laughs> to uh, to manage conflict. <laughs>